Fred, when you came to the Williams campus as a freshman in 1932, what kind of a place did you find? I, I was wet behind the ears, came from a high school in Detroit, having led a fairly sheltered life there. I walked into a kind of society that I had never known, the country club society. Finney Baxter, when he became president, wanted to get rid of the impression that this was a country club college, and indeed it was. Uh, these were the Depression years, but these were people who had money. They had perhaps fewer cars in their family than they'd had before, but they weren't really suffering from the Depression. And it was dominated by the fraternities. The first thing anybody did when he arrived freshman year was to go through rushing. There was no mention of academic life for over a week. Hmm. So that the stamp uh, that was made on you was the fact that social status was the most important thing. I was utterly bewildered by this. And I joined a fraternity not knowing what I was doing. That's the chief impression that I got. It was actually a relief to me when classes started. And Charlie Keller started teaching me history and Nels Bushnell started teaching literature. Then college became a, a less bewildering and much more pleasurable. Uh, when did you know that you wanted to be a teacher? <clears throat> I honestly can't say that I ever thought seriously about being anything else. <clears throat> My parents were both teachers. My grandfather had been a missionary, which is kind of a teacher. Uh, in India and Persia, but my father had been an English teacher and then a high school principal in a big high school in Detroit. My mother had been a kindergarten teacher. And uh, I grew up in the world of education. That's what I meant in part by my sheltered life when I was a boy. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I wanted to do, uh, I had Nelson Bushnell in English. I knew I wanted to major in English. And I knew the next thing I wanted to do when I graduate was go to graduate school and study some more literature. <laughs> what kinds of changes have taken place at the college over the years, and how do you assess them? Well, socially, I can say that the college has improved in every respect. In many ways, uh, by 1960, the fraternities were eliminated. Um, and I always like to say that the initiative well, this came from the students. Uh, Jack Sawyer, who was president, responded very well to this. This was an extremely difficult thing for him to undertake. And he did it with firmness and grace that I will never forget. Uh, during that same decade, he very gently introduced the enrollment of girl students. By the end of the decade, girls were part of the William scene. And then since then, it has become multicultural in a way that it never was. Uh, I think these are three extraordinary improvements. So I think socially, Williams is a far better place. Tell us about the wedding in California uh, you and Carol recently attended. This to me is the greatest compliment I've ever been paid as a teacher. In fact, it, it's, it's delightfully humbling. Uh, I had a student who graduated some years ago who uh, got married last summer. And he had invited us to come to that wedding uh, if I would recite a poem or read a poem for him that was appropriate. And I was honored by this invitation. And I thought about him. I knew him and I knew the lady he was about to marry and the kinds of people they were. And I picked a poem which I thought would be appropriate. It's a poem by E.E. E. Cummings from a volume of poems called One Times One. I have to say a couple of things in advance to make it a little intelligible. intelligible. The word one refers to the uniqueness of every human being. No one in the history of mankind has ever been exactly like Bob Bell, and no one ever will be again. That, you can say that about anybody. In fact, that is a wonderful thing, that creation never repeats itself. In fact, you could say 
isn't that something? And one of the lines in this poem is there's nothing as something as one that is a unique person. The other interesting thing about the poem is that it pits in, puts in opposition uh, books and teachers and rational activity and intellectual distinctions and distinctions between singular and plural and all kinds of things we do with our minds against just being alive, intuitively, instinctively, irrationally alive. And of course, irrationality wins out and the climax in the triumph of irrationality is mathematics. Because when you multiply one times one, you don't have any multiplication. One times one times one, you can multiply all night long and you still have only one and that's not multiplying at all. If everything happens that can't be done and anything's righter than books could plan, the stupidest teacher will almost guess with a run, skip, around we go, yes, there's nothing as something as one. One hasn't a why or because or although, and buds no better than books don't grow. One's anything old being everything new with a what, which, around we come, who. One's every anything so. So world is a leaf, so tree is a bough, and birds sing sweeter than books tell how. So here is a way, and so year is a my, with a down, up, around again, fly, Forever was never till now. Now I love you and you love me and books are shudder than books can be. And deep in the high that does nothing but fall with a shout each around we go all, there's somebody calling who's we. We're anything brighter than even the sun. We're everything greater than books might mean. We're every anything more than believe with a spin, leap, alive, we're alive. We're wonderful, one times one. I turned around and looked at the, at the couple at the end, and they were just glowing. That made me feel better than anything I've ever done. Are you a religious man? I'm not in the conventional sense of my religious man. My parents brought me up in what I re now regard as an oddball, kind of nutty Protestant sect. And when I went to college, I decided that it just wasn't true and rebelled as young people do against that and was for a while extremely anti-religious. I was not quite so foolish as to become an atheist because I, had a, I was taking philosophy at Williams and realized that that was just as dogmatic a position as the position of a believer. Since that time, I've gained a lot of respect for the reasons why people are religious Religions bring coherence and a kind of meaning and purpose to their lives. And I think it's important to have coherence and a feeling of meaning and purpose. And for me, this has been brought by art, particularly literary art. When I read a good poem, The Ode to Autumn, I feel coherence. I feel I'm in the presence of truth, not the final big truth, but a truth. This is a coherent, beautiful truth about autumn and about life and about an attitude toward life which one can assume. I don't think I taught literature to enable students to find the equivalent of a religious belief. I have taught literature to enable students to experience a pleasure that would be otherwise unavailable. I think pleasure is important. And um, I wanted to teach an intelligent delight in literature. Uh, I wanted them to be able to enjoy literary experience for the rest of their lives. In that sense, I guess I was a minister, but a kind of hedonistic one <laughs> that other ministers might not approve of. I notice uh, young people out jogging or out walking, and more and more students are doing that these days. They're listening to uh, a cassette that's playing in the air or to a radio. When I go walking, I recite the poems I know. I find this a, just a pure pleasure, and if I get far enough from civilization, I can do it at the top of my lungs. One of the pleasures I have in Maine, particularly if I'm alone and it's low tide and the gulls are all over the bay, 
I, uh, I love to recite at the top of my lungs, Hausman's Terence, this is stupid stuff and listen to the gull squawk <laughs> as I approach. It's a very funny poem and a delightful poem. And it's just a pure personal indulgence, but I enjoy it very much. <laughs>